Galileo Galilei is arguably the most important scientist to ever live. He perfected the first telescopes, turned them towards the universe, and what he discovered changed the course of history forever. Galileo provided the first real evidence that the Earth is in orbit around the Sun. This belief went against the Catholic Church, resulting in perhaps the most scandalous and saddening trial of the last 500 years. Stephen Hawking said that Galileo is more responsible for the emergence of modern science than any other human to ever live and Einstein called him the father of modern science. And despite all of this, Galileo spent the last seven years of his life under house arrest. And to answer why, we need to go back to the beginning. The year is 1564, and Galileo Galilei has just been born in Pisa, Italy, the same year that William Shakespeare and the great artist Michelangelo will also be born. When he was eight, he moved to Florence, perhaps the most beautiful city in the entire world, thriving in the middle of the Renaissance period. Galileo's father convinced him to attend the University of Pisa where he would study medicine, but he wasn't passionate about medicine. What he loved was mathematics and science. He left the university after just four years without actually getting his medical degree. This same year, he began teaching mathematics in Florence. Just three years later, he would return to the University of Pisa, but not as a student, as a mathematics professor. And it's in Pisa where Galileo made his first significant contributions to science. Aristotle, arguably the most influential natural philosopher of the last thousand years before Galileo, believed that objects will fall at a rate proportional to their mass. For example, if you dropped one ball that, say, weighs one kilogram, and another that weighs five kilograms. The five kilogram ball should fall five times faster than the one kilogram ball. Galileo thought that this was wrong. And so as the story goes, Galileo went to the Leaning Tower of Pisa and drops two objects from the top, one heavy and one light, but they are both roughly the same physical size. He drops them and watches as they fall to the ground, striking the floor at nearly the exact same time. But why does this happen? The force of gravity is proportional to an object's mass. The more mass, the stronger gravity pulls on it. The more massive an object is, the more force is needed to accelerate them. This additional force that is given by gravity perfectly cancels out the additional force that is required to accelerate the object, meaning all objects fall at the same rate in a gravitational field if you ignore air resistance. But this wouldn't be the last time that Galileo took on the ancient Greeks. After his three years in Pisa, Galileo moved to Padua near Venice, where he would work as a professor of mathematics for the next 18 years. And it's here in Padua where Galileo would fundamentally change our understanding of the universe forever. At the time, the Catholic Church, and by extension, essentially everyone in society, believed in Ptolemy's view of the universe. Ptolemy was a Greek scientist living in Egypt in the second century CE. In his view, the sun and all the heavenly bodies rotated around the earth. Aristotle had already proposed that everything above the earth was perfect and incorruptible. But at the time of Galileo, many if not all astronomers believed in a different system proposed by the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe. In this system, all the planets and the stars in the sky orbited the sun, while the sun orbits the earth. Just before Galileo's birth, Nicholas Copernicus published his work on the revolutions of celestial spheres, in which he argued that everything in our solar system, including the earth, orbited the sun. At the time, the book was met with some mild controversy and didn't receive any major support. Most people just assumed that it would be proven wrong eventually. Copernicus died the year his work was published. But for Galileo, he wanted to understand exactly how the universe worked and which of these systems was true in reality. So what he did next changed everything. In 1608, glassmakers in the Netherlands had been making unbelievable progress in creating quality lenses. It was only a matter of time before someone put two lenses together and noticed their magnifying capabilities. A glassmaker named Hans Libesche from Middelburg created the first telescope. He submits a patent for his creation on the 2nd of October, 1608. In the patent, he described his creation as a Dutch perspective glass used to see things far away as if they were nearby. 
The most powerful tool of the scientific revolution has just been invented. Over a few months, the word of this invention spreads throughout Europe, eventually making its way to Galileo in June of 1609. At the time, Galileo was just 45 years old. When he hears about the invention, the best telescopes in the world were capable of increasing human vision by just a factor of three. But Galileo thought he could do better. He immediately travels home to Padua from Venice and that night begins creating his own telescope. It takes him just a few days to have his first prototype. He even learns how to perfect his own lenses from scratch. After just two months of development, his creations have become so good that they are capable of eight times magnification. But instead of turning it to the stars immediately, he first demonstrates its abilities to Venetian lawmakers, offering it to them as a gift. Seeing its military potential, they accept his offer. Galileo's final telescope is 20 meters long and 37 millimeters meters in diameter, it is capable of magnifying objects by 20 times. When I visited Florence, I looked around in the Galileo Museum and these are his original telescopes that he actually did use to make these observations. After perfecting his creation, Galileo finally decides to do something that no human before him has ever done, point a telescope towards the cosmos revealing its deepest secrets. He first points the device towards the moon, seeing craters, grooves, and mountains. This is in contrast to the accepted belief of the time that the moon was a perfect, smooth surface, unlike the Earth. Three months after he was able to create the first telescope, at 5 p.m. on Thursday the 7th of January 1610, Galileo is in his garden in Padua with his newly developed telescope. He is about to change the course of history forever by doing something that seems really simple, pointing his telescope at Jupiter for the first time in history. Galileo sees three fixed stars that are extremely close to Jupiter. Over the subsequent nights, he continues to watch, noticing that these objects appear to wander like satellites around Jupiter. They appear to become obscured by the planet, and just six days later, Galileo notices a fourth object in orbit around Jupiter. They were seen to change their position relative to Jupiter, but always stayed in a straight line. These are, of course, the moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. He initially tried to name the four moons the Medicean stars after the Medici brothers, a notable family in Italy. This helped him to secure prestigious positions at the University of Pisa, but the names didn't stick. These moons of Jupiter would forever be known as the Galilean moons. He published these findings along with his observations of the moon in a short book titled Sidereus Nunculus. This translates to the Starry Messenger, and the results were not received well. People believed that his lenses were defective, and what he was seeing was simply an illusion. Aristotle had described the cosmos as being filled with these perfect, unchanging bodies. God had made a perfect universe. Who was Galileo to say that he didn't? And if everything in the universe was supposed to be orbiting the Earth, how could there be moons orbiting Jupiter? The people this offended the most the Catholic Church. The most prominent figure in the Catholic Church at the time was Cardinal Robert Bellamine. Anytime they needed an interpretation of Holy Scripture, it was Cardinal Bellamine that the church would look to. The Catholic Church was planning to make a ruling to say that only bishops and councils of the church would be allowed to interpret the meanings of the Bible. No one else could especially not someone like Galileo. Galileo was actively arguing for the heliocentric model of the solar system, that the Earth and all the planets orbited the Sun. Now importantly, Galileo did say the whole time that God's word was always correct and trustworthy, but he also said that scripture can't contradict what is true in nature. To the church, he was just essentially reinterpreting the scripture and saying that they were wrong. He defended this by writing a letter to the Grand Duchess Christina of Tuscany in 1615. He says in it that the church and science are compatible, but holds that if science tells us something that is true in the natural world, it is just unreasonable for the church to expect scientists to ignore their discoveries and just blindly trust the approved interpretations of scripture. He writes, for this would amount to commanding that the astronomer must not see what they see and must not understand what they know, and that in searching, 
they must find the opposite of what they actually encounter. Pope Paul V sends Cardinal Bellamine to visit Galileo a month before they ban heliocentrism. Bellamine was instructed to tell Galileo about the upcoming decree, as it would make his work heretical. This meeting would turn out to be the most important meeting in Galileo's entire life, as if he continues down this path, he would find himself on trial for heresy, his life at risk. Remember this visit. The next year, in 1616, the Pope decrees that heliocentrism is heretical due to it being false and contrary to the church's scriptures. In doing so, they banned Copernicus's book on heliocentrism until corrections were made that essentially just removed all the suggestions of the Earth orbiting the Sun. After publishing his results from his studies on Jupiter, he set out to be more precise and quantify his observations, applying a systematic approach that today we would just call the scientific method. By looking at the moons of Jupiter over a longer period of time, he was able to roughly measure their orbital periods. But finding a more precise calculation proved extremely hard. He continued working and his periods got more and more precise, but something still seemed off. And then he had an idea. Maybe the orbits he was measuring seem to be inaccurate because the Earth is in orbit around the Sun. By accounting for the motion of the Earth revolving around the Sun, his problems were solved. This discovery did not hold with the principles of Aristotelian cosmology. Many astronomers and philosophers just refused to believe that a man like Galileo would be capable of making such a momentous discovery. But Galileo had done it, and he didn't stop there. He pointed his telescope towards Venus, and it was showing phases similar to those that we see the moon going through each month. Using this fact, he concluded that Venus must also be orbiting the Sun, not the Earth. The Ptolemaic system for the universe was falling apart at the hands of Galileo, and the Catholic Church knew it. Seven years after receiving his visit from Cardinal Bellamine, Galileo's friend becomes the new Pope. So Galileo chats with this Pope about the heliocentrist problem, and they agreed that he could write about heliocentrism if he did it in a theoretical way. And so in 1624, Galileo gets to work, writing probably the most important book he will ever write. Eight years later, Galileo publishes the dialogue concerning the two chief systems of the world. In accordance with the advice that was given by the Pope, in his book, Galileo writes about two fictional characters, Salviati, who argues for the heliocentric Copernican system, and Simplicio, who is a follower of Aristotle, arguing that the Earth is in the center of the universe. It was believed that Galileo's character, Simplicio, was an attack on the Aristotelian geocentrist view of the world. I mean, after all, Simplicio in Italian literally translates to simpleton. Salviati easily won the argument, suggesting that his views were correct and suggesting that is what Galileo believes. The Pope reads the book and becomes furious. The Roman Inquisition bans the sales of his book and calls him to trial in 1633 for heresy. At the time, Galileo was nearly 70 years old and extremely unwell. He was on trial for his life. The proceedings were conducted by 10 cardinals, all of which were personally appointed by the Pope. Their job was to protect the Catholic beliefs. Right away, the church turns their attention to the year 1616 and asks Galileo what he remembers of his meeting with Cardinal Bellamy. He says that he was informed by the Cardinal to only speak lightly of the heliocentric model and no truth be taken from it as it went against church doctrine. The church called Galileo a liar and said that he was ordered by Bellamy all the way back in 1616 not to write or teach anything about heliocentrism at all. To prove this, the prosecutors produced a letter that Cardinal Bellamine had supposedly sent to Galileo after they met, recounting their discussion. In it, Bellamine says that Galileo was told, henceforth to not hold, teach, or defend heliocentrism in any way whatever, either orally or in writing, otherwise the holy office would start proceedings against him. This seems like case closed. Galileo was told to not talk about it, and he did, so he must face the persecution of the church. But Galileo was a smart man, and he keeps records of his own. Galileo dramatically brings out the original copy of the same letter that he received from Cardinal Bellamy. This one was written by Bellamy and signed by the man himself. 
The Roman Inquisition didn't know that Galileo still had this letter, and this is where things get interesting. The letters were not the same, in fact they had one major difference. Galileo's original copy of the letter didn't say that Galileo was ordered to not talk or write about heliocentrism in any way whatsoever, or he will be persecuted. Galileo's letter just says that heliocentrism is wrong and shouldn't be explicitly advocated for. And since the dialogue was a fictional story, he broke no rules. The entire trial relied on this letter, and somewhat suspiciously, the church's copy just happened to have this one key addition that they were using to convict Galileo of heresy. Some scholars have suggested that the church faked their letter to bring down Galileo and maintain their worldview, preventing the church from losing more followers. But I'll leave that up to you to decide. To make things worse, the court asked Galileo whether he had received an imprimatur for the dialogue. This is essentially a seal given by the church to certify that there is nothing contrary to Catholic faith. And Galileo had received not just one, but two imprimaturs for his book. The church had brought to trial someone who had written a book that the church themselves had approved of. This trial continued for weeks. Towards the end of the trial, Galileo was interrogated harshly and threatened with torture if he did not tell the truth. The case against Galileo was weak, and there were many parties who wanted it to end quickly. Galileo's health was deteriorating, so the prosecutor struck a deal with him. He would plead guilty to some minor offence in writing his book for a lighter sentence. Galileo would keep his life, and they found him vehemently suspect of heresy for his opinion that the sun is at the centre of the universe. He was sentenced to live under house arrest, for the rest of his days. Galileo's book was banned, and all of his published works and anything else that he might write was also prohibited. He did eventually decide to write again, writing a book called Discourses and Mathematical Demonstrations Concerning the Two New Sciences. This book summarised much of his work over the last 40 years, and it was smuggled out of Italy to Holland where it was then published. Einstein highly praised this work, and it's the reason that many people consider Galileo to be the father of modern day science. He didn't suffer in prison, tortured for years, but his physical and intellectual freedom was imprisoned by the Catholic Church until on January 8th, 1642, he finally passed away in his home. The Grand Duke of Tuscany wanted Galileo to be buried in the Basilica of Santa Croce, but when he was condemned by the Catholic Church for heresy, he was instead buried in a small room next to the novices' chapel at the end of a hallway. Nearly 100 years later, he was moved to the main body of the basilica, and during this move, three fingers and a tooth were removed which are now on display in the Galileo Museum in Florence. In 1718, they finally lifted the ban on reprinting all of Galileo's work, with the exception of the dialogue. It wasn't until 1835, 200 years after Galileo wrote the dialogue, that the ban was finally lifted. Galileo was locked up for supposedly ignoring an order that he very well may have never received. But even if he did receive it, it was unjust. The church was telling the astronomer to ignore the true nature of the universe and just blindly follow what they deemed to be correct. And if he and all of us scientists did as they wish, I'm sure we would know nearly nothing about the universe today. In the questions of science, the authority of a thousand is not worth the humble reasoning of a single individual. Galileo looked towards the stars using his homemade telescope and made observations that changed the course of human history forever. And the best part is, you can do the same using a telescope from Unistellar. Growing up, I would use telescopes to view the moon regularly, and I would always just be amazed at how the moon would have looked exactly the same to Galileo as it does to me looking through a telescope today. You can see the same ridges and craters the sunlight cast across the surface. It always amazed me and made me feel connected to Galileo through time. But both Galileo and I were not able to see galaxies and nebulae using our telescopes, and that's where Unistellar comes in. They create extremely powerful and smart telescopes that are specifically designed for urban environments where light pollution can be a problem. And while some classical telescopes can take hours to set up, I can go from the telescope being fully packed away in this backpack 
to observing the night sky in just five minutes. This is their Odyssey Pro telescope. It's extremely powerful and capable of viewing planets like Saturn and Jupiter, just like Galileo did, as well as seeing deep sky objects like the galaxies and nebulae you see online. And the best part is, because it's a smart telescope, it has an integrated digital camera and processing, meaning you can do advanced astrophotography using their iOS or Android app from the comfort of your own backyard. The telescope's catalog has over 5,000 amazing objects it can locate for you allowing you to truly explore the universe with ease. I have genuinely never used a telescope that is so intuitive and user-friendly while still providing professional results. In fact, Unistellar works with NASA on their citizen science program, which allows everyday users like you and me to make real scientific discoveries. Some users actually did this for the DART missions last year. So if you want to explore the universe just like Galileo did 400 years ago, then click the link at the top of the description and use my promo code astrocobe 1020 which will get you 20% off your telescope purchase.